ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Welcome everybody to the fourth episode of On Air Actually Rocket Science. My name is Jan Luca and sitting next to me I've got Benedict, who like me is currently in his third semester of the Bachelor Aerospace. Buckle up for a journey out of this world as we welcome a true space expert. He's a physicist, astronaut, TV host, best-selling author and for almost 20 years now he's head of the chair of astronautics at TUM. He has a vision for humanity's future that reaches far beyond our planet and he's here with us today to answer all our questions. Welcome, Professor Walter. Hello to all of you. So like in the past episodes, we want to start with a quick warm up, which is a game of this or that. I don't know if you're familiar with the, no. with the concept. It's pretty simple. We just present you with two alternatives and you quickly have to decide which one you would rather choose. Okay, good. So let's dive right in with the first question, which is Mars or Earth? For what? In general, just Mars or Earth, say one of the two words. Both. Both, okay. Staying on safe ground or going back up? Back up. Time traveling to the future or to the past? Only to the future. Commercial or public astronautics? Both. Space shuttle or starship? Starship. Okay, very interesting. So, as we mark the 30th anniversary of your Space Shuttle Mission D2 this April, yes. let's take a moment to reflect on your incredible journey to becoming an astronaut. Okay, yeah. Your flight as a payload specialist aboard Columbia Space Shuttle was the realization of a dream and a testament of your determination. But first, um, we need to reflect this time. I mean, Germany was not always such a well-established player in mm -hmm, spaceflight mm -hmm. as it is today. So, Professor Walter, what inspired you for, to apply for the selection process in 1985 and later undergo the intense training? In those days, uh, Germany looked for science people in order to do science in space. So this is why they called for scientists. And in those days, I was a physicist. I studied physics in Cologne. So I thought, well, doing science, doing physics in space is a very good idea. So that's actually the reason why I applied. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your journey to reaching Earth orbit was filled with meticulous preparation mm -hmm. and perseverance. Yes. Frankly, so, so. I have great respect for the work astronauts are doing uh -huh. and their preparation mm -hmm. as they push the envelope. Yeah. Um, but are astronauts always so well prepared or can you remember any, any challenge you faced during your own mission? Well, you must be well prepared, otherwise you can't stand the mission. Yeah, for sure. On the other hand, um, 80% of all training was so-called off-nominal training, meaning be prepared for the unexpected, okay? And actually, you can train that. Uh, and as I said, it was 80% of all the training. So 20% on the experiments, things like that. And 80% so-called green cards, meaning you're doing your training and right in between you get a green card saying uh, the uh, heat of on experiment number 55 failed. Uh, please check out and uh, tell us what's wrong and give us an idea what we could do. You know, things like that. So this is off nominal. And so then you're even prepared for the unexpected and this is really a good idea yeah it really makes sense because risk is obviously associated with space exploration mm -hmm. and should be well weighed i mean the challenger disaster in yeah. 1986 occurred only some weeks after you applied for the program mm -hmm. right and another rare occurrence uh, when your initially planned launch was aborted at t-minus three seconds mm -hmm. i can imagine that this was not particularly oh, yeah. safe I mean, how did you evaluate the risks associated with your mission, especially as a husband and father? Well, it's actually not my decision to say yes or no. It's actually the decision of the family. Now, let me tell you why. Because I'm familiar with dealing with risks, right? I mean, every engineer does it. So, yes, I know there is risk, and I said to myself, uh, NASA says there's a 1 in 100 chance that I will be killed in the mission. Okay, and I'm saying I will fly once in my life. I'll accept the risk. 
But if I would be dead, I wouldn't actually care. It wouldn't be a big problem to myself when I am dead. When I'm dead, the problem is with the family because they have to live with that I'm no longer there, actually, or even more my kids. So actually, and this is what I did is I talked to my family, to my wife, and said, you decide. You decide whether I keep up my application and that I will fly or not. And that's what she did. However, she didn't decide on the spot, but uh, we agreed that... Uh, she would give an answer or decision uh, after a month. So she had one month of thinking about the pros and cons of a mission. And then she said, yeah, I think still it's a good idea that you do it. Though she was always afraid that something could would happen. That's of course. But she accepted that this was something very important for me in my life. And I think this is this is true love, so to say. That's a beautiful story, really. <laughs> um, so we already talked about the fact that your first launch was aborted. Mm -hmm. um, we, however, we now want to go into the second launch where you really went up and we want to ask you what it feels like to launch on top of a space shuttle and maybe what the last thought was that came right into your mind before uh, the ignition. Oh, uh, you know what? We had several aborts. However, not on the launch pad, but one day before, two days before. So... I would say delays of mission. And this was, we had three, two delays and one liftoff on Kennedy Space Center. So there was another one on the April 24th when a gimbal, actually yeah, an IMU was not running well. So I decided to delay the mission for another two days. And also, but this is actually very normal for shuttle missions and even today. So you have to accept this. Well, and this is the reason why we said, well, yes, it's okay. Let's wait another two days. Actually, the the, the, the launch abroad in, in March took a month of a delay. This was different because we didn't know what was the real the reason. And they later told us, well, we have a valve we didn't, which didn't close. And when it happened the second time, which was on April 24th, we decided... Oh, this is Groundhog Day. <laughs> and actually, we went to uh, the, the, the movie center and uh, watched, we looked at uh, the movie Groundhog Day. Yeah. So, and then one day later, we took off. So, how does that maybe affect your trust in the system if there are oh, multiple not at all. boards? Not, not, at not at all. all. Not at all. You still 100% no. trust the engineers. No, well, I mean, it's hard if you have a launch delay, three seconds or not delay a scrub three seconds before liftoff. I mean, the engines are running. You're sitting on top of 2,000 tons of fuel, and this is not just any fuel, it's hydrogen and, and oxygen. I mean, this is quite annoying, so to say. However, you know the people who are handling the shuttle, you know them personally, and you know that they did everything in their life to make this come happen and with the best reliability, okay? You cannot not ask for more of the people. So, you know, everything which could, is, could be done is done. This is all you can ask for. And with this thought about the people, knowing the people, you say, okay, let's do it, okay? And even if there is a scrub, you know, that every, every, everyone did his best. So, yes, you take the risk again, yeah. And you know if there's a scrub, they know when to scrub and when not to scrub, okay? So you have to rely on persons. You have to know the persons. And this is very, very important. If you do, wouldn't know the, the people, if there is, um, yeah, it would be a totally different situation. Okay, it's really interesting that kind of a scrub might even improve your trust in the system because yes, you don't know. Yes, it's because I understood why they scrubbed, and there were the scrub is was I said safety first, okay, and this makes you a good feeling, because it was a quite annoying situation, but you know they they had a grip on it, they knew what to do, and this was important for us, and then you do it again. Yep. So. Now we're going to the situation where the boosters light up and you there's no return and you go into space. What does it feel like? Is it as chaotic as it seems from outside with all the no, uh, totally different. The fuel totally burning? Different. No, no, no. It's a totally different situation because you know it's risky. 
the boosters are the most risky part of this of the mission and they burn for exactly two minutes so i remember sitting there the whole thing is shaking you know like a, 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 a volcano you know when it's erupting it's really very impressive um so you're sitting there you're really hot shaken hard and then you experience this shaking the loudness everything which is coming into into your body and you really it's like i don't know you don't think you just experience what happens to you okay without thinking and when these two minutes actually the eight minutes was over you know it's kind of wow it's over and how oh, this was damned risky you know and then and then you're bringing thinking about what you've experienced so it's more like you are without thinking you're embedded in a total in a situation which you cannot handle you're just sitting there and let it happen okay and this is like you know you have a car crash on the on the street and within seconds you're exposed to something which which you can't handle you know and only after five or ten seconds when the car comes to a hold then you're saying whoo wow i could be dead now you know this is the kind of situation you're in wow that's that's really amazing um so once you're up there i guess you have a couple of minutes to calm down a bit and then you probably look down on earth first yes. thing I mean, I can't even imagine how no, impressive first that, thing, that has no, been. No, first thing is taking off your flight suit. Okay. Or flight suit, the, the, the pressure suit, the launch and entry suit. This is the first thing you will do. Okay. The very first thing. So you unbuckle yourself first, and then immediately you, you take off your pressure suit. And then you're right. Then you go. Next thing is go to the windows and have a look on the earth. Yes. So I can't even imagine how impressive that is to look down on earth from it up there. It is really impressive. Let me tell you why. Because... When you're training and you talk to your colleagues and the astronauts and are telling you how it will look like, it's all your imagination how it will look like. You never saw it before. It's like you're going to Italy and people are talking to you about Rome and you know things like that. You have never seen that before. But standing in Rome, looking on this gigantic city and seeing with your eyes is totally different. And the same happens up there. You know, you're looking downwards uh, and it's... An impression you see 180 degrees i mean you know it's not a small photo but it's really impressive so that makes a very big difference so is there something that made you realize this new perspective and maybe yeah. something you would like more people to realize by getting this uh, what, perspective what impressed me first is because it's totally silence up there because you don't have engine running or whatever the impression is that you're standing still while the earth is rotating below you okay so it's an inverse inverse effect like two trains you know and one is starting and you think that you're driving and the other is standing but it's the other way around you know it's the same so you're looking down and saying well i'm standing saying the the earth is turning like this because you're going that way that was the first thing which came to my mind said well it's it's worse and then i looked down it was i remember it was over the pacific ocean Actually, the probability that you will fly over the Pacific Ocean is very high because it's half of the surface is covered by water, in particular Pacific Ocean. And it's all blue, you know, and it's blue, 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 and a lot of white, which are the clouds. And the clouds, and this was interesting to me, the clouds are not just statistically dis distributed over the blue surface, they make up a structure. The structure is may be different they are so-called gravity waves i learned later okay gravity waves is that the density waves of up and downs of the of of the atmosphere and when they go up the the, the the humidity become cloud and vice versa so you have a wave of clouds and this is called gravity waves and this gives a very nice structure and in particular there's, for example, these clouds and anvil clouds which are going up, and this is also happening in, in given distances. So everything makes a kind of uh, symphony, okay, you know, 
it's not really very well structured. It's not well, a full harmony, but like a symphony, it's like here it's a little bit louder and less louder, you know, and different, slightly different structure. So this is how it looked like from above. And this impressed me very much. I remember that quite well. It's a nice image to have mm -hmm. in mind of the symphony mm -hmm. of the clouds and of nature. Mm -hmm. As a payload specialist, you had a unique opportunity to conduct scientific experiments. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about one experiment that stands out as one of your favorites? You know, I'm a physicist and I have a very favorite one, but it's so tricky and complicated. It's about a triple point. I don't tell you about this. I'll tell you about an easy one, which is nearly as nice. Okay, I'm, I'm really fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's about biology. Have a look at this plant in front of us. So the plant is growing up and the roots are going down. So the biologist never understood how a plant, how does it know what up and down is? Because they have no organ, no sensor for up and down. So they have no vestibular system like we have, okay? So the biologists knew that. So nevertheless, there was a question, how then, how do they know what's up and down is? And they could not figure it out here on Earth. So they came up a biologist saying, well, let's do the following. We take a plant into space, into microgravity. Actually, we took uh, uh, mushrooms. So we take mushrooms up in space and have mushrooms the same type down here and let it grow down here and let it grow up there. In space, they will grow in all different directions because there is no gravity. Then we make so-called histograms, which is very thin cuts. And by the thin cuts, you will have a look into the structure. And then you compare the high histograms of the earth-grown mushrooms in space-grown mushrooms. You put it next to each other and then have a look at the different structure of the cell, of a cell. And if there is a difference, it must be due to microgravity, and it must tell you what the reason is why plants know what up and down is. And this is actually the, the way how we really learned, how the biologists, how they know today why a plant knows why up and down, how they know what's up and down is. That's really fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, bringing this section about your mission um, to an end. Um, but just before, we would really like to, like to know, nearly 30 years after your mission, at what moment stands out as the most memorable for you? Was it the launch? The most memorable, three things. First is launch, of course. I mean, it's so impressive. It's, as I said, it's sitting on a volcano. It's only eight minutes. Actually, the volcano part is only two minutes. It's the uh, boosters. After that, it's a qu quite smooth, but a uh, high G ride, okay? Eight minutes, it's very impressive. Second is the view of the Earth. And the third is uh, the experience of microgravity, of weightlessness onto your body, okay? Because it's a totally, you, you never have it here on ground, okay? It's a totally new experience of your body. and. There's another point, namely, to get back to your family, and it's over. It was very hard, two very hard weeks, working all day and night, you know. But it was enjoying to see family back, yes. Mm -hmm. That's really nice to hear. Mm -hmm. So moving on to your time after the launch, you really got into science communication. As we already mentioned in the beginning, you're an author, you're a TV mm -hmm. host, and yes, you do teaching, yeah. with, which yeah. is also just a form of commu communicating yes, science. That's right, yeah. So we want to ask you, what's your motivation behind all that work and effort you put in? Oh, that's easy to say, because it was all in my life that I understood that knowing something is one thing. My father was a teacher, you have to know. Okay. So, and he did a very good teaching. I learned a lot by him. And understood after some while when I was a student that knowing something is one thing. To tell another one and to make him understand how things work is a quite difficult thing. You have to abstract from your knowledge and tell it quite easy to another one. And actually on the level the earth is on. You know, if I'm talking to the public, it's a different level of speaking than talking to the students, you know, in, in orbit and flight mechanics, and I can use equations. So I have to adapt to the listener, to the audience. And actually, this is this came this came a little bit late to understand that it's not me who I'm talking. So it's more 
to consider the situation of the listener of the audience and try to understand what his, he or she is expecting from you and from knowing that how to talk to the people. Okay, so and this is why you have to take this different level of approaches. Okay, this came quite late, but once you once understood that, it actually makes fun to see that when the other is smiling and you see the smile in his face, and you see he understood it. You know, even these small boys are sometimes sometimes coming to me after a talk, and making very actually complicated question, but expecting easy. Answers. For example, I remember a very small boy was about five or six years and came to me and I said, Mr. Walter, you an astronaut. And I asked so many people and nobody could give me an answer. I hope that you can give me the answer to the long standing question of me. And said, Okay, tell me. And he said, What is the temperature in space? Okay, and I thought, this is a question question no adult asked me, but it's a very interesting question. And it's not easy actually to give an answer. So it took me about five minutes to explain that there's actually not really a temperature in space because there's no atmosphere, things like that. And I saw in his face that he understood it. Okay. And then after about 10 minutes, he walked away and I saw he was satisfied. Yes, he got it, he understood it. And for someone who is teaching another one, no, for, for me, there is no better experience than to see that I've given someone something which you couldn't get from someone else, okay? And that's my, I think that's the reason why I like teaching. So is that also the reason why you joined Tillman in 2003? Or what are the other benefits that you see in academia? It was two. two I love sorry. research. Okay, I'm really a researcher. It's like Anshan. I'm, um, uh, I'm. Uh, it's called neugierig. Um, I'm curious. curious. I'm highly curious. I like to do new things. Okay, so I said. I love research. I don't. I was at IBM in those days, and they did developing projects, which is a nice experience. But not actually, actually, what I like to do. So I said, let's do research again, uh, and let's be together with students and teach them, because I've learned a lot. Because when you're with NASA, you know, you learn quite a lot of things, which you can also give to the students. This is why it's, I'm teaching systems engineering, which is nothing to do with research, but just experience how to manage big systems. Mm -hmm. Can you provide us with an example of your research work from nearly 20 years at Tom? Oh, yes, we did uh, um, uh, life support systems, for example. Well, you have to do two kinds of research uh, in an institute. One is where you get money from, you know, <laughs> so-called th th third-party money. So this is why I applied for DFG money or whatever. And on the other hand, there are topics where I say, I don't care about getting money. I just like and do it. And a life support system is something like that. So I started modeling life su better life support systems. And I did that without getting money because ESA and DLI don't give you money for that. But I liked it very much. And there we did a lot of research, which I, the other kind of research is more engineering type. This is more basic research. And actually I like basic research. This is why I did this book, Astronautics, which you might know, which is actually really basic theory, you know, and this is what I like. But I do also like application. So this is why we have the ground station here on top of the building. So we talk to satellites and things. It's also something I like to do. Yeah. So how has your work contributed to the advancements in conducting experiments and missions in space? Well, we do quite a lot of space robotics, which is Taylor Robotics, which I think contributed a lot. Um, life support been NASA is using our modeling system, so-called VHAP for modeling life support systems. And we now going to make a cooperation now with MIT, with a Japanese institution and NASA to even make this VHAP modeling a little bit broader. So the all the world as an open source uh, um, code to make it possible that everyone can use it. This is a good feeling that you make things possible which couldn't be done before, you know. This, that's what I like. I like open source. Yeah, that's really great. 
So uh, as we're already talking about Tum, kind of, mm -hmm. we have to take a quick break due to technical reasons. And okay. uh, during this quick this quick break, Marius will tell us a bit about university politics, and afterwards we will explore what the future of space exploration might hold. Beyond the level of the professional profile, university politics is mostly about the exchange among representatives of the study programs. On these levels, there are fewer different committees and they often do not impact the individual student as directly. The decisions made on these levels usually have more large scale and long term effects on the university. The committees are the school council and school wide student council, as well as the senate and council of student representatives on university level. The positions for these committees are elected by all students in the university elections during the summer term for the following academic year. School Council and Senate are the highest decision-making committees in the school and university respectively, whereas the School Student Council and Council of Student Representatives are purely student committees that discuss, formulate and express the needs and wishes of students. Beyond that are some closely cooperating teams for the different universities in Munich, such as an overarching team for mobility and the Bavarian statewide student representation called LAC. After our discussion about the past and current state of space exploration, let's now look ahead towards the future. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned in the past you believe the 2nd of August 2048 could be a landmark date in space history, mm -hmm. with humans potentially landing on Mars for their first time. I think that's an exciting thought. <laughs> so, <laughs> Professor Walter, please tell us what makes you so confident in predicting a first manned Mars landing for this date? Well, it has to do something with orbit mechanic, which is how planets orbit around the sun. So we all know that Earth is orbiting the sun and it's a quite circular path. The difference with Mars is that it's much far outer and it's a little bit elliptical, okay? And that makes a big difference because if the constellation between Earth and Mars is right, and this happens every two years, then you can make a transition from Earth to Mars. And as my students know, this is a so-called Hohmann transfer, which is an ellipse, okay? So you make an elliptical transfer, and it takes about 200 days. This happens every two years, roughly. But now, because Mars mass trajectory or math orbit is elliptic, it makes a difference whether you fly or start such that the path is shorter, namely because here is a periapsis, or there's the apoapsis, okay? Because the outer path is elliptical. So you can show that every 15 years, then you get a so-called slow delta V transition. And delta V means low effort, okay, every 15 years. Now you can ask, which year do you have a low effort transition? And the answer is, it was in 2018, next is 2033, and the next after that is 2048. I see. Okay, so one could say, what, what about 2033? And the answer is, well, we can't do that until then, because though we no, the technology, we don't have the reliability of a mission. So if you fly them in a manned, uh, manned way, then the probability that we will do it and we don't die during this mission is quite low. Still quite. I would say to come back safely is about only 10%, roughly. Okay, this is too low. So we have to increase reliability. This is the issue of the next decades increase liability, know what to do to increase liability. And this is what Elon Musk and NASA is working on to increase reliability, make things really happen. And I think they can't do it until 2033 because it's only 10 years from now and you need at least 15 years. Okay, then it's the next, which is 48. But now Elon Musk says, um, well, yes, 15 years is a good story, but I don't care about less effort. I would pay for being there first rather than waiting for an effortless transition. And this is why I now think if he really takes it serious, I would say, yes, it might happen at the end of the 30s rather than at the end of the 40s, yeah. if he really pays more for that. But um, 
I know that it's 48, right? Because it's, and we'll have the reliability until there. So I'm sure it will be 48. It might be that we're at the end of the 30s already there. Let's see. Why do you think it is important for humans to venture places like Mars and Moon, despite harsh conditions and those potential challenges mm -hmm, you were already mm -hmm. talking about? Yeah, there are two answers to that. One is because we can do it. And this is the answer of a very famous uh, Bergsteiger, a mountain climber. He said, he was asked, why do you climb the Himalaya, Himalaya the Mount Everest? He said, it, it's deadly, it may be deadly. 10% of the people die. And he said, because it's there. <laughs> okay. And this is why we went to the poles, the North and South Poles, because it's hard, you know. And I think this is a reason to get to places where no, no one has been been before. Once you have been there, then you're trying to make uh, the not the best out of it, but to get something out of that. Let me give you an example. When the US had their moon missions, then NASA decided, let's make not money, but make use of spaceflight. And this is why they did the space station, because they said, let's do science and commercial experience in space. This is why they built the space station. And then after 20 years now, the American public says, oh, we are pioneers. We are not only scientists. Let's really be explorers, get out to there. And this is why uh, Bush in 2003 said, let's be pioneers. Let's go to Moon and Mars again. Okay, so we go to somewhere to experience something new. The second is Mars is the only place to figure out whether the beginning of life as it happened on earth also happened somewhere else that is a transition from the inorganic stuff to the first cell and this is a very unprobable transition but it can happen we know that it, it happened on earth so if this happened also about 3.5 billion years ago on Mars, and we know in those days Mars was wet, it had a lot of oceans, and it was humid, and temperatures were about 25 degrees Celsius, so perfect um, environment. When it happened also, also there, then the probability that it happens anywhere when the temperature and water is right, and then the probability that we're not alone in the universe is quite high. If so we, if we do find something which is not from Earth, biology not from Earth, then we can be sure we're really not alone, even in the neighborhood of the Earth. If we don't find anything, um, then this doesn't say too much because then it's a question of the probability how it could happen. If you say one in 100 planets it happens, then Earth and Mars is only two rather than 100. So uh, you could say, well... Bad luck, okay? But if we find something, I mean, this would be breathtaking. Yeah, exactly. So we definitely have really good reasons to go there oh, and yes. explore this planet. This drives all the scientists to Mars. Yeah, and you already touched my next question a bit. A journey to Mars will last months. Thinking of returning back to Earth mm -hmm. would result in a two years mission at least. At least, yes. So how do you think will the challenge of long duration missions, such as boredom, stress, mm -hmm, or even mm -hmm. interpersonal conflicts, mm -hmm. influence the design of future spacecraft? Yes. I mean, this is an important point because you know if something bad happens in the mission, you're by yourself. It's not like making a trip to Asia for two years, and then there's a hospital, you go to a hospital, you know, you have something, you go to a, there is no hospital on Mars waiting for you. So you have to be prepared for taking care of yourself. And this is quite hard. It's not hard of taking care, it's, hard, it's a psychological side, which is hard. Because, you know, once I made my boost to Mars, there is no way back within the next two years. And that's psychological, very hard thing. Uh, so, and this is why reliability is so important. I will do that only if I know I'm coming back alive. And well, yeah, so we have to be psychologically prepared. We have to know the technology and to make sure that it's reliable. Uh, but then, and even me, I would say, yes, when I'm old, I'm old, when I'm old, if my kid's out of home, you know, 
And my wife says, you have a life insurance, good life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Then I would go. Two and a half years in my age is not a big thing. Two and a half years for a young guy who has family and kids, which is only five or three years old, it's a different thing. So, and this is what I always said. I think only people who are quite old will do such a trip. But then it might be highly pleasurable. Very interesting. So you already mentioned Elon Musk, who probably yeah. is the strongest and most, the most famous advocate yes. of sending humans mm, to yeah. Mars. Mm. We're interested in your opinion on his undertaking, whether you think Starship, not only as a carrier to Mars, yeah. but mm. also as, mm -hmm. as an everyday launcher, let's say, will succeed. Well, when he came up with his plans for going to Mars, I was very reluctant and said, well... I'm not sure whether this is really such a good idea. And then I had a look, a deep look into his plans. And then I realized that he had such a lot of money put in good people, into engineers and scientists, and they worked out a concept where I said, this is very well done. So it's not a splitting idea, it's really something solid he is based on. And this Surprise, surprise. This convinced me that he is on the right path. And he is putting a lot of money into this. I mean, also personal monies. It was a situation where I was asked how much money he put into this. And he said, I put from my personal money $1 billion dollars per year into that. Now he's getting money out of that, okay? But in the First years, he put a lot of money, and he's convinced he has the money, he can do it. And this is why there are so few people like Bezos and, 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 and Elon Musk who have the possibility with such a lot of money to make such rockets. And in this way, he stands out. You know, Airbus could also do that. They have also a lot of money, you know, but they don't have a vision, you know. They are... Uh, actioneer, so people who want their money back, and you know, if you're convinced of that you don't care about getting money back, you want to do it. And this is like Bezos and Elon Musk are. And this is the only way to get to Mars. Okay, so if we imagine a world where Starship is in service and they, they can hold, they can live up to their promises of very low costs and yeah. um, very Low is low, relative. Very high loads to, to orbit. Low is relative, you know. Yeah, yeah so you are cost paying relative 50, to yeah. the load. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so very, very high loads to orbit. Is Europe and Ariane as the biggest European launcher still competitive in that new and reshaped launch market? What do you think? This is a hard question. And I don't think so, no. In the long run, we can't survive. So how do you think we can tackle that? Is there any, any hope, let's say? No way to tackle. Okay. Not even we already good lost. engineers from TUM. <laughs> yeah, we already lost. Okay. You see, it's, it's, it's an easy calculation. I mean, an Ariane 6 now coming up, which costs less. They're saying we can do it now for 90 million euros. We know already they can't do it for 90 million. It will cost about 110 or something like that. Whatever. Now there is Elon Musk. He says, a trip to space, 63 million. Then comes Jeff Bezos and tells Elon Musk, by the way, I am building New Glenn and I will ask for 30 million. He already tells, no. And Elon Musk says, no problem. I also can... Do it for 30 million. Now, in the future, there will be rockets, big rockets, not the small rockets, the startup rockets, big rockets for bringing big satellites into space, and there where you make money for 30 millions. And there will be other rockets which take 110 million. So, what will you do? I mean, where will you fly your satellite? On 30 million or 110 million? And take on the Bundeswehr, military. They had three new satellites, so-called ZARA, radar satellites. And about five years ago, they had to decide what was a rocket to bring these satellites, military satellites, and decided not to bring it on Ariana, but on Falcon 9. 
And then I went to the military and said, how can you do that? It's, this is commercial and Ariane 5, this is where you should go. And you know what they said? They said, you know, the government gave us amount of money. And they said, do the most efficient, use it the most efficient way. And when we have to decide between Ariane 5 and Elon Musk, which is 60,000 and currently Ariane 5, 120,000, we had to do it with uh, Elon Musk. So you see, even governments don't use any more Ariane 5, but take the cheaper uh, possibilities. And this is, if even the government don't make this come true, meaning flying with Ariana, the commercial companies won't do that. So actually, I think we already lost. So do you think that German or European startups in the micro-launcher market still have a chance? Or yes. Or will that still be covered by the big rockets no. with No, 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 launches? this will not be covered because it's a totally different market section. No, they have big chances and they do it quite cheaply, actually. Uh, they don't ask for a lot of money. And you can't fly a big satellite, say, five tons, which is a geostation, with such a small rocket. Small rockets uh, like uh, aeros uh, is aerospace, they get up to 80, 100, uh, 800 kilograms. So it's a totally different uh, type of satellites. So they're different markets, and they don't interfere. If we now have the private sector taking over completely, mm -hmm. um, do you think that it's overall good because it it boosts the space industry and we might get to places like Mars or is the dependency on the private sector in the end too high in such a critical industry like space? We should never, I, I, commercial, I like commercial market. However, as a government, you should not only rely on commercial market. And this is how the US does it. They always had and have their institutional rockets, which is Atlas and Delta, and they won't do it away, uh, even if there is a market of Elon Musk and, and in the future Jeff Bezos. They will also, and this will always be much more expensive than the commercial one. But nonetheless, they're saying if something happens, if for whatever reason we cannot rely anymore on commercial, we need to have our own rockets. But if we have the the, the option, then we, of course we also take them. And th and I think we still also we also should do it here in Europe. But this means that the governments in Europe that they take their military satellites and put it damned on a, on a Ariane and not on a commercial uh, rocket. Do you think it's only about the satellites or do you think Europe should also be in the independent in the sense of being able to uh, to do crewed missions, so manned space flight from Europe with Europe, not yeah, from Europe with European Oh, Russian this is a good rockets. question. Oh, this is a very good question. I think that in near-Earth space, in so-called cis lunar space, I think we don't need governmental manned space flight anymore because this all will become commercial and they will also take over commercial space flight. However, moon and beyond, we need not commercial. You, you can't make money out of that. So we need institutional space flight, manned space flight. Yeah, so let's now focus on this private sector mm -hmm. because we can clearly see an emerging trend. Mm -hmm. You said it, Elon Musk, he isn't the only one in this currently ongoing mm -hmm. billionaire yeah, space race. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said it, we have Richard Branson, mm -hmm. Virgin Galactic and mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos with his Blue Origin. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the rise of this private manned space flight sector and uh, the potential for space tourism? Oh, I like it. I love it. For two reasons. Because... Today's rockets are very expensive and the price must go down. And the only way to achieve this is competition. Okay, so we have an oligopol currently. So the US had their rockets and the Europeans and the Russians, and they had their own share of the market. And this is why they could keep the prices high. Now comes Elon Musk and says, half the price. No, half the price. And now, you know, the people, the European are sweating because Ariane is twice as much. They have to get down to their prices. Uh, and this I like very much. And the second is commercial people are much more flexible than governmental. It's a kind of, I don't know, it's part of how it's been done, okay? Even NASA, there's uh, 
verknöchert, so, which is a, a stubborn system, and every institutional system is more or less stubborn. Commercial must be flagged. And this is why I like this commercial. And But as I said, we also need governmental institutional rockets, satellites, and flight. We always need that. I told you the reason why. So it's we need both, actually. Yeah, I also want to focus on the benefits and drawbacks of this new tourism. Some might argue that it is a frivolous pursuit for the wealthy, contributing mm -hmm. to climate change, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. while others might argue that the so-called overview effect experienced by space travelers leads to a profound shift in their perspectives and values. So that means that um, they have a greater sense for in for the interconnectedness of all life on planet Earth afterwards. What is your stance on that? I mean, they are both right. Um, the question is, what is more important to mankind or to the people? Well, if you would say to the people, you know, driving to Italy or Spain or Greece takes a lot of CO2, you know, so don't make vacation anymore in Italy. You know what they were, people would do? They wouldn't care because it's vacation. It's something good for, 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 for psychology. I mean, you want to do that. It's important that you work, life balance, or whatever you call it, it's becoming better. So what I'm trying to say is there are different aspects why you do things. And one of the aspects of spaceflight is, of course, to see you in a different context of the universe, to understand that actually not only a person, but the total human mankind, it's nothing in the universe. Our culture was driven to date, in particular in religion, but also in, in culture at all, as saying there's nothing better than humanity in space. Okay, this was the old picture from the Greece, you know, from religion, and this is totally wrong. So to get a different perspective and to set the context right, you have to see it by yourself. And this makes a difference. As I said, I was told by different colleagues, oh, if you look down on us, it's stunning, it's great, you have to see it by yourself. Telling is one thing, experience is a totally different, and only then you act differently after that, okay? Not by a, a movie in the theater, but by if you see something. This make you think differently. And this is why I welcome uh, space tourism, because people are able to see things by themselves and this will change the people so you really think that in future this could be a matter of routine that people go there mm -hmm. maybe once in their life in the beginning yeah and okay. then this becomes cheaper in the future yeah, I know. and this is more worth than the other arguments yes there is more co2 into the atmosphere so say to give an example but you know if you fly only once in your lifetime it's so expensive any flight also in the future will be much more expensive than driving to italy you know driving to italy takes i don't know uh, a week uh, 2000 euros flying to space takes you 20000 euros in the future you will do it only once in your lifetime but if you do it only once in your lifetime and you don't need more travels then It's, I mean, the CO2 addition is restricted. I did a calculation and it will add about 0.1% of the total CO2 uh, we currently produce. So it's, it will be a very small part. But the change in mind, the mindset change is, from my point of view, much more important than this 0.1% additional CO2. So you're saying this change in mindset That's the thing you can only experience when really going to space, yes. seeing it yourself. That's completely different than seeing a picture from space. This is right. The thinking and the acting of a person having seen that, only the seeing by himself makes it different. CO2 mitigation and mm -hmm. climate balance is, of, is mm -hmm. of course a topic for politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And politics plays a huge role in, yes. uh, in the large scale of mm -hmm. astronautics. Mm -hmm. We want to know how much of a role it plays in the small scale, so in the relationship of cosmonauts and also astronauts of different countries if, when they're up in space and there is a conflict down on Earth. Mm -hmm. You mean what? how they handle the situation? How they handle the situation, how it influences maybe the friendship that obviously develops over such a long time? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all? Okay. <laughs> you know, there are currently 580 or so astronauts all these astronauts are 
part of the Association of Space Explorers. And we'll meet once a year, this year in Turkey. And we're usually 100 to 150 people. Everyone knows the other one. I know even the family of the other colleagues. It's a family, you know? So if you're a family, and even if members of the family are from Russia, from Asia, I don't care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything if Putin says, I make war against Ukraine. Why should my opinion or whatever change to a member of my family? You know, it's all the same. And it's not only me who are thinking like it. We all think the same way. So it's really a family. Yeah, what shall I say? However, if I'm a space station and I'm an astronaut, and my boss on the ground tells me, please take the flag and hold it into the camera, namely the Russian or Ukrainian flag. What shall I do? I have to do that because he's paying me. Okay, so this is why the Russians did it. Okay, they put the flag into the camera, the Russian flag, and said here, Russian. Okay, well, you can do nothing against that. But except from that, the personal relationship doesn't change. Okay, that's... Really beautiful to hear that there's kind of a bond still between between all yes, the astronauts. Yes, that's true. It's just a human yeah. interaction there. Mm -hmm. uh, if we go back to the large scale, um, do you think there's some kind of line we could draw up to which or from which on we as Europe or as Germany should cooperate with other nations in terms of their stand political standards, their values, if we, for example, take Russia? I didn't... So, so is there any point which you could define that we say, if that happens, then we can cooperate with, let's say, Russia, mm -hmm. or uh, up to this point, we can cooperate th with them, but that from then on, no longer. Well, let's take a concrete case. We have a satellite, an astrophysical satellite called Irosita, which we built up and flew with the Russians together. We switched the satellite off because due to the war and well this is part of politics because they don't pay and we say no we don't want to make science together version they switch the satellite off erosita well what shall i say it's politics they're saying don't make science with russians on the other hand i would say why shouldn't I make science with Russians? And we did science with Russians, and I have good guys over there because science is independent of money. It's just science. It's neutral, so to say. Okay. So this is why I'm advocating, and the same as with the Chinese. I have a very good cooperation with Chinese. Science is the bonding, the glue between the nations and the people, and it's good to have that. Understand that when politics and government comes in between, they may change things, but I'm convinced in the long run, in the long run, science and the personal relationship glues people together. And this is stronger than politics. This is what I'm convinced of. And in particular, space travel or going to space, the mind shift will make things even better to the bonding, the glue, rather than to war. As we now approach the end of our discussion, just before, let's delve into some intriguing philosophical questions about our place and purpose of humanity within the universe. Mm -hmm. You once stated we are kind of prisoners of our own solar mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. with the next star being Proxima Centauri mm -hmm. in a distance of 4.3 light years. Mm -hmm. that's, that's like a gigantic distance. We just cannot escape and explore the sheer universe. And given the numerous challenges facing our planet and its inhabitants, people might ask, why should we choose to focus resources and efforts on exploring space rather than addressing the issues at hand directly on Earth? Oh, you know, this is called, this stance is called the absolute moralistic stance or the uh, moral rigorism meaning i'm moral and whatever we do we must 
do it morally. If this would be the case, I'm not advocating it, if this would be the case, we actually are not allowed to do vacation, go to theater, go to the opera, because there's always a more moral thing to do and invest money. Okay, I'm more a so-called utilitarianist, which is the English way of thinking. The English way of thinking is there are different aspects of life. I want to sleep, I want to eat, I want to have vacation, um, I want to enjoy my life. It's all part of my life. So what I have to do is to get a balance of all that. Okay, We can agree or disagree on how the balance will should look like. And this is a discussion in TV and what we see. But in general, it's not only one moral aspect we have to take care of, but many things we have tried to do. And this is the utilitarianism of the English saying, okay, what other aspect do we have to serve? And also part of that is going out there, use space, actually make use of space to travel there, and it will be also part of our life. So why neglect it for other reasons? So the answer is yes, let's do it. However, it shouldn't be a big part of it. It should be a, just a, a small part. A small part which makes enjoyment, to make science, make things philosophical understanding, the role of the human in space, things like that, not more. Yeah, I want to bring up a comparison. Um, so astronauts, certainly cannot survive without their spaceships. Mm -hmm. What does the concept of Earth being a spaceship with humanity as its crew yeah. suggest about our obligations and duties towards the planet and its future ah, sustainability? Okay. okay, yeah, we are sitting all in one boat, that's what I'm usually saying, and we have to take care of ourselves. Nobody will help us. There is no God helping us. We'll have to take about it. You, when you see it from outside, you really understand it. So this is one big reason to do space tourism, to see it by yourself. And then we'll take care. And then we'll understand it doesn't a nuclear war doesn't make sense, okay? Once you see that. So yes, spacefaring is understanding this. On the other hand, spacefaring tells you that once you're deep in space and look backwards to Earth, There's a very small, pale blue dot out there, which is so small, it's negligible. It doesn't play any role in the universe, okay? So what you're saying is, actually, whether we live or don't live, it doesn't take care of the universe, you know? It doesn't make a difference. And even more than, we have to take care of ourselves, because if we're no longer, no, nobody cares. We have to take for, take care of ourselves. So taking care of ourselves is the essential part, so to say, of space flight. And this helps. So space tourism helps a lot in this sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's inspirational. To hear. It's very inspirational. Very, very. I think it's really interesting to see this insignificance as kind of a motivation. It's to, a motivation. To, to, to stay is, yeah. alive. <laughs> That's yeah. right. <laughs> This is a high motivation, yeah. So having a look at the time, I think uh, we sadly have to come to an end. Just like very sadly, your time is at Thomas coming to an end at, at the end of this March. Um, what is your plan for the next years? We're you going to your well-deserved Continue. retirement? Continue. <laughs> Continue. Okay, so we can expect to Because see you around. I still have uh, 11 PhD students, so I have to serve them, so to say. I, I, I will guide them in the next three years so, or roughly three years um i will do lectures will continue lectures okay, as cool. it looks like not that many as before because i now have colleagues who take over but there will be every semester one lecture okay so it it will f phase out slowly over the semester so to say that's a relief to hear it's <laughs> yes, really nice to hear so finally is there any message you want to send out to all the students watching and listening to the podcast yes there it is and the message is out there the public usually ask me how are the students today are they interested are they conspicuous what is their mental state and i said they are still very good it didn't change anything you know one would say well they are more dull and corona 
didn't contribute to be better, have better students, but this is all wrong. The good students are here. They like to make study, they like to understand, and it's a pleasure for me to teach them and help them to get a good job in the future. Thank you very much for participating in this podcast, Professor Walter. It was really a pleasure and so fascinating to hear to your stories and to your, your, your expertise. That's, that's really great. Thank you so much. Okay. I have to 100% you. agree with you on that point. And to the listeners, make sure to like and subscribe. Of course, stay tuned. But first of all, enjoy your well-deserved vacations.